This copyrighted broadcast is presented by All Paws Pet Talk Radio and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. Any information or segments of this show and all of the shows may not be disseminated without express written consent from the All Paws Pet Talk producer. Medical information obtained from our website or the live show is not intended to be a substitute for professional care. If your pet has or you suspect they might have an illness or other medical condition, you should consult a health care provider. The opinions expressed on this radio program are not necessarily those of All Paws Pet Talk, this radio show, or their sponsors. Hey folks, welcome back to All Paws Pet Talk TV and Radio. My name is Chris Rubin, your pet industry expert. I am joined here once again by my famous, infamous panel members, one of them being Janice Weiss, a Columbia grad, has trained thousands of dogs and horses, and is a canine and equine behaviorist. Not only that, but she rescues animals. That's why we love her the most. Hi, Janice. And we have the Italian guy, the guy educated at the University of Parma, Italy. His name is Dr. Don Canfer. He's been in practice, mixed practice, in Florida and Europe all of his career. Welcome, Don. And you do know Dr. Marty Becker. You must recognize Dr. Marty Becker, fear-free Marty Becker. We're going to talk to him. But first, we're going to go to Animal news you can use because that's what we're here for to educate you to entertain you to edutain you and with that i'll throw it over to you janice thanks chris well today's news you can use is actually out of harvard so the ivy league has finally caught up with animal behavior harvard researchers have found that reported dog bites tend to go up on days with higher temperatures uv and certain forms of pollution we're going to take this explain a little bit about what could be happening and also expand that out into how that might impact your pet on any given day, especially those of you who have a dog or a pet who is reacting differently to different situations on different days. So as from Harvard, heat, sunlight and pollution might make some dogs bite happy. New research out Thursday suggests. The study found that reported dog bites tend to increase on days with higher temperatures as well as days with higher UV or certain pollution levels. Though more research will need be needed to confirm the findings, the authors do say that other studies have found a similar link between hot weather and aggression in humans and other animals. So that's the basics of it. Now, one of the interesting things there is everybody has a different level of patience and tolerance, whether they're low blood sugar and they're not eating and they're hangry or it's a blazing hot day. If you look at the number of um, parents who lose their temper with their children, uh, when you're outside and you're hot and you're stressed, stress creates anxiety and anxiety can create a change in behavior, not just for animals, but obviously for humans as well. Um, so a lot of this I think is kind of intuitive, but it's interesting that there's actually now research to explain why this might happen. We'll definitely keep track of this and see if we can kind of follow it. But I wanna expand that out into dog behavior. Um, every Sunday I have a group that meets uh, here in New Jersey. And you guys are welcome if you're nearby to come along. The main thing that we do is we expand the dog's limited circle of what it sees. Some dogs will be more protective or more reactive, not just with changes in weather, humidity, or, or even time of day, but they'll also become more protective over what they consider to be their own, like what they own. The same as you might be much more protective of your own home versus at a hotel lobby where you don't really feel like you have ownership of it. So I wanna just bring that in for a moment into those of you, and I've heard this for years as a behaviorist, why is sometimes my dog doing really crazy things one day and then he's perfectly fine with the same person or the same item or the same environment another day? And it's interesting to think of how animals are much more complex than anybody has ever given them credit for. So in my estimation and in my experience, for instance, yesterday, 
uh, we had somebody come in with a dog up to the vet hospital and we have a 95,000 patient vet hospital. So I'm up there a fair amount. This was a golden retriever and the golden retriever had bitten a six year old boy in the face. Mm -hmm. So of course this is, you know, it's a golden, right? I mean, not that goldens can't have problems and certainly many of them do, but that's America's breed. I mean, I'm, I'm a rich fat person, but like when a golden does something like that, you just, it's like the world is like spinning in retrograde. There's something really wrong with the earth and, the, and the, just everything surrounding that. So in looking for the potential reason why this formerly pretty good dog, two-year-old male, um, altered, um, might have on this particular day or evening created that situation or had something in his mind where he felt that he had to bite, I went into detail with the owners. Well ties into our news you can use they were outside they were at a campground and the campground they had these big adirondack chairs and there was a fire they were sitting facing out from the fire pit so this little six-year-old boy came toward the dog to pet the dog took his hands around the dog's face we have to teach children we have to try to dog proof children so we don't have to child proof every dog the child took the, the golden's face in his hands, starts kissing him. The dog tried to pull away, but there was a fire behind him. So he couldn't pull away. He felt trapped. And that's why that happened. You could take that fire away and that whole incident most likely would never have happened. And I never would have heard of it. And the child wouldn't have been bit. We can say, yes, it's the child's fault. But I'd like to hear from my co-host and our guest about why people don't just educate their kids. This kid, they were dog people. And that's part of what I've always tried to do with scout troops and 4-H clubs and explorers and uh, all the different types of uh, groups that get together with animals is educate kids to even educate each other. Hey, Johnny, that's not a really good idea because the dog doesn't know you and it's at night. And one of the biggest times that I see where issues happen with animals is dusk through dawn in darkened hallways and darkened areas, especially if somebody's wearing a hat or a hoodie and the animal is looking up. So the perspective is different. And all of a sudden, we get these terrible things happening. So I'm curious, Chris, if either of our guests would like to explain uh, perhaps Dr. Marty can come on here as well and explain why Fear Free is such an amazing thing. Janice, you, um, God, I love listening to you. You said so many things that I made a mental note of uh, off air. You talked about if people thought about dogs being like horses. I live on a horse ranch and I was up working with the horses today. And you, if you want to startle a horse, you're probably going to get uh, kicked over the fence or trampled or some, they're going to rear up and hit their head on the underneath the barn and all sorts of things. So we know that you let them know you're there. You know, you always let them have your hands on them. Just yesterday, the dogs got a bath and I was out. We have a dog graveyard up here at Almost Heaven Ranch. So we live up in the very tip of Northern Idaho. If you if you want to win at the original Trivial Pursuit, there was one question, what state is surrounded by six states in a foreign country? And that's Idaho. So if you go clockwise, it's a full height of Montana and Wyoming. It's 80% of Nevada and Utah. It's a full height of Oregon and Washington to the west. And it just gets kind of skinny at the top there. It's called the Idaho Panhandle. We live right up there six miles from Canada on a, on a horse ranch. So I'm out there in this dog graveyard and Teresa lets the dogs out after the bath. I am uh, what, probably 150 feet away, and the dogs do not recognize me. Uh, even though I'm, I'm talking to them, it's still because it's a different setting. You, normally, I would be with them, not a, at a distance coming. So it's just so funny how those things can happen. And my daughter, Mikkel, is a well-known trainer. She's co-authored five books, got so many letters behind her name when you ask uh, siri to call her siri gets hoarse before she ends up getting done with all these darn letters behind her name and 
one of her pet peeves is the social media pictures of people thinking how cute it looks to have these dogs mm -hmm. maul the, or these kids maul these pets. And you, you got to remember, you know, they, they are a predator. They have, they have reactions in, in, out in the wild that can save them. And so sometimes he's manifest itself. And one of the things I was thinking of my colleague there who uh, dresses better than I do and has a nicer office than I do. One of the things I think uh, Janice and Don is that it's un undiagnosed pain or undertreated pain. And I just had a, a dog recently that, that had aggression that it never had before. And Dr. Don, we, we looked, we did all the imaging. Uh, we did uh, ultrasound. We did radiographs. The blood chemistries were normal. And we're like, what? what is causing this dog? Could there be a cause of aggression other than mm -hmm. something psychosocial? And we did not take dental radiographs, but we did do medical rounds. And we took a hemostat, which, you know, looks like this is like a thing. We're just a little into the hemostat there and started tapping the teeth. And we came to one, and that dog literally went into orbit. Um and it was uh, an infected tooth. So once we did the dental x-rays, that's what it was. And literally, that dog was under a nerve block un with an analgesic or painkiller under general anesthesia, and it could still feel that tooth when we were working on it. That's, how, that's the rawness of that pain. And when that dog came out of surgery, it was like, uh, dare I say, a puppy again. It was so much more affectionate. But... Uh, I just think a lot of times, you know, we see these things, Janice, and you talk about some of it is, is our lack of training. And Janice, you mentioned something else, and I'll, I'll shut up here because I'm brevity challenged. You mentioned something else. When it comes to fear free, I, I'm not, there's so many people in the past that knew we had to look at the emotional well being of animals. I'm not the first person to do this. Uh, boarded veterinary behaviorists, PhD behaviorists, were talking about this for a long time. It's just that they never had a, a pulpit. They never had a voice. And people like Sophia Yin was talking a lot about the animal handling piece of this. And that's what animal handling is one part of it. So I'm not somebody that has some crazy gift. Uh, Temple Grandin, who is on the Fear Free Advisory uh, Board, she has a crazy gift. And I could talk about her going into a companion animal practice, which I'm, I'm sure Dr. Don would be interested in. But we now know how to handle these pets properly. We know how to, uh, you know, people that have trauma in their life can go to a psychiatrist. They can get counseling. They can take medications. We have no idea on so many of these pets what their background is, but through proper diagnostics, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, we can pretty much guarantee every pet has a, a visit where they're not traumatized and every pet parent doesn't have to feel like they're hurting their pet by trying to help it. Don, what say you to all this? Yeah, that's that's uh, quite interesting. We, we've actually touched on this uh, several times before, you know, when when we're discussing animal behavior and, uh, you, you know, Janice and, and I guess Dusty when she was with us, you know, anytime you get a sudden change in behavior or even a gradual change in animals behavior, we keep emphasizing this on the show is bring it to your veterinarian because oftentimes, more often than not, the, there's going to be an underlying source of pain or irritation. And, and you mentioned irritation, you know, that, that, that bit from, I think you said Harvard, uh, where they did, there's some Ivy League school where they did the study. I, you know, for those of us that understand animal physiology and a and little bit of animal psychology, you know, it comes as no surprise. Uh, you know, all living organisms respond to noxious stimuli. And the higher the intelligence of that animal, the more they relate to humans, the bigger and better their repertoire of, of, of action to those things is. And, you know, it's so thing on a day when it's, you know, it's hot, you know, cats and dogs, they, you know, they can't sweat. They, they put up with the heat by panting, which is not the most efficient of systems. And so the heat can get to them as well on a hot day. 
you know, if, if, if the air pollution's up, there's odors in the air, you know, how much more sensitive is their sense of smell than ours? And odors that we may not even perceive may be very annoying or irritating to them or challenging to them if they think it's, it's the odor of a, of a rival animal in their, in their territory. So it's, it's no surprise that on days when, you know, there's more air pollution or more ozone in the air or this or that, that, that you know, the animals are going to respond with behavior changes that we can perceive. Uh, just yesterday I started, you know, we're, we're another what? two weeks from 4th of July. And just yesterday, I had the first of my clients coming in asking for tranquilizers for the uh, for the upcoming fireworks, not to mention that here in, in Florida, we're already getting our thunderstorms. And we're already starting with the tranquilizers for the thunderstorms. And, you know, we have to remember animals, particularly, you know, dogs that, that suffer from these phobias, you know, they, they can smell the ozone in the air, they can sense the drop in the air pressure, they can hear the rumbling of the thunder long before the weather station even tells us that their storm's coming. So they're, they're aware of this and, you know, it's, it's, it's affecting them and sometimes we're not even aware of the cause because the storm is too far away. But what they're doing is they're just reacting to their environment, which is what animals do, what humans do. Dr. Don, I got to chime in here. I don't know if Parma in Italy is like Harvard. So when Janice talked about the fact we just introduced, she's from Columbia and she's quoting stuff from the Ivy League, Harvard and stuff. And then I, I went to Idaho State University. I feel a little, I was a little jealous, but then you're so darn articulate. Parma must be, uh, must be a good school because that was, that was really good, Don. It, Don, I want to piggyback on something you said about you know, these dogs have exquisite senses, not every sense, right? We know like their their vision is not as what ours is. They, they detect motion really well, but uh, time for the old, the book show here. I wrote a book with two boarded behaviors called From Fearful to Fear Free. One of the things we look at, I don't know if you're in the Tampa area, that's the thunderstorm capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And the only place I can think of worse to live as a dog that has a noise phobia would probably be in Orlando or Anaheim, where the Disney fireworks go off every night at 10 p.m. And we actually did a study, Fear Free did, with dogs that were living near Anaheim that had noise phobias. And we've also done stuff on thunderstorms. So you mentioned thunderstorms about ozone. One of the things we know is they get a build up of static electricity in their coat. And that's why a lot of dogs want to go to a basement in a shower on tile in a car because they're grounded. And if you take an unscented fabric softener sheet and rub it on a dog's trunk, if there's uh, uh, thunderstorms in the forecast, in 30 to 40 percent of the dogs, they won't react to the thunderstorm because it's electricity in their coat. You got to try it to believe it. Uh, and then, Dr. Don, you mentioned. Uh, tranquilizers. I was just on a flight overseas and I came back through the Delta Hub in Atlanta and I got to board the plane because of fly so much, got to board it early. And it was one of those in the concourse where you go down one jetway, it takes another turn, it takes another turn to try to wedge it into this part of the terminal. I could smell anal glands from 300 feet away. So I go in there and there's a dog bouncing around the cabin. This, it looked like uh, there was an earthquake going on in this carrier. And I introduced myself and asked about the dog and she was, uh, you know, uh, really upset. The veterinarian had prescribed acepromazine and that's contraindicated. Uh, it's not that acepromazine can't work with some other drugs, but Fear Free convened, uh, we had, eight boarded behaviors, eight, uh, eight boarded uh, anesthesiologists. I think there's four PhD behaviors like you, Janice. And we have the best uh, sedation protocols on the planet. So I, I felt so bad for that dog. And they, of course, they trust their veterinarian. They think they graduated at or near the top of their class. For God's sakes, if anybody's out there, don't let your veterinarian prescribe based promazine for noise phobias. There are um, Alprazolam, which is generic Xanax, works extremely well. I got a dog sitting right by me here that uh, if he's on Alprazolam or generic Xanax, that damn thunder can hit, damn near hit our house and it doesn't affect him. And there's the FDA approved product Celio from Zoetis. That's a dexmedetomidine gel that you rub on their gums. And Janice, you probably have seen this used in horses that have trouble being shooed and stuff. Um, so 
talk to your veterinarian. There's not a single pet out there that should suffer from, uh, from thinking they're going to die this 4th of July. Wow. And, you know, this brings me back to an article I read the other day, which was uh, the zip codes out there where the most postal employees have been bitten. And I wonder if you <laughs> if you overlay that on some of the environmental patterns, the things you guys have been talking about, I wonder if that is a match, if you so will. Hey, folks, we'll be right back to All Paws Pet Talk Radio and TV, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Burt Ward, Robin from Batman, and I believe there is nothing more precious than life. 20 years ago, we got a dog for our daughter to grow up with, and she became our daughter's best friend. Everything we did with our dogs, she did with her dog. Then she fell in love with two Great Dane puppies. We were worried because we knew that large dogs normally live only seven to nine years. But we found a way to keep her dogs and our dogs wonderfully healthy and living many years longer. Living as long as 27 healthy, active years. We created Gentle Giants, a special low-fat, heart-healthy, super premium dog food, and a unique feeding and care program that we believe has added precious years to the lives of our dogs. And we'd like to do the same thing for you and your dog. Life doesn't have to be too short for your best friend. All natural, Gentle Giants, for the longer, healthier, happier life of your dog. Gentle Giants for life. Folks, welcome back to All Paws Pet Talk Radio. Um, I wanted to add on to something that Dr. Marty said and something that I've been working on for many, many, many years. Um, people don't prepare for things. Um, I'm also, I've got certifications in like pet loss and bereavement counseling, things like that. But what's interesting is people don't prepare for things that they know are going to happen. Why do we wait until two weeks before fireworks? Listen, I'm a horse person. I've bred Lipizzaner uh, horses, Lipizzan and New York State uh, racing thoroughbreds for many, many, many years. And I used to walk my stallion and my broodmare out by myself to the breeding shed, breed them and walk back. And Carlos and Eduardo, who were two of the guys who were with me for many years, used to call me La Jefa Loca. Uh, because I'm about 5'3 and about 110 pounds, but my energy was big. And if you're not afraid and you feel confident, then you're not going to bring that out in your animal. So a lot of times that people don't realize that they wait until it happens, right? So let's say for, for 4th of July coming up, even starting now, if you start, go get yourself on YouTube some fireworks, and put it on an endless loop, super, super low. So you can, it's barely audible. And put that in an area that your dog associates with something good, like where it eats, where it plays. And just leave it on, just don't even turn it off. And every day, just turn it up just a tiny bit louder, just a tiny bit. Eventually the dog becomes desensitized to a lot of those uh, different sounds. And I learned that with, uh, I, dealt, I deal with a lot of feral dogs. And also I used to have horses and people would bring me their horses. They couldn't even get near them. And you have to just start slowly and you have to prepare it out ahead of time. Bring your dog to your vet's office when you're not going to be get, getting him his spring shots or horses, I guess, spring shots, his annual shots. Bring your dog with you to other places so that He's not always associating, it, associating going there with going to the vet, going to the groomer he might not like. Take him out. I tell people, drive your car around for 30 seconds. Go just out, barely out of your neighborhood and take your dog out and take him for a fun walk or take his toys and play with him and then get back in the car and come home and have fun there. Because otherwise, it doesn't take very long for these dogs to realize that, uh-oh, we're going in the car. The same thing as people amping their dogs up before they go out on a walk. Cannot tell you how many times I'm sitting in somebody's living room and just to goof on them, I'll say, you want to go for a walk? Where's your leash? And the dog goes ballistic. And I say, so you're already starting your dog off, setting him up to fail because you're already amping him up before he goes out. I want you to take that leash, pick it up. I want you to say, here's your leash, put it on the table go watch TV, pick up the leash, put it somewhere else. 
and and keep saying those things desensitize your dog because if you think your dog is getting crazy on a walk it's because you may be making him crazy on a walk even before you get there there are so many reasons that animals do what they do thyroid issues i mean a, a significant heart murmur like a three plus heart murmur uh, I saw a Rottweiler, beautifully bred Rottweiler, but he had a severe, he was a four heart murmur, grade four, and he was super aggressive. Well, you can't really fix that, but the dog ended up um, having a seizure because he had so many other issues, but certain things you can't fix because they may be medical, and I'm big on our place. Um, we have a CT, an MRI, um, we've got every gadget and gizmo, um, so if we do want to see if the dog does have something, we even have a, a boarded um, neuro neurosurgeon neurologist who's also boarded in internal medicine um, who does brain surgery. So things are fixable very often, but I find that either things are medical or that the owners are creating it. So for instance, today I was just uh, doing a board and train for a very nice uh, dog who's been here a number of times, Milo. I had that dog doing things. He was pristine. I had the owner hold the leash when he came today after 10 days in Italy, not visiting you though, Don. And he came out, he literally took the leash and the dog went after the same three dogs, the three of my Ridgebacks, went after my dogs wanted to eat them. But he was perfect with me because he knew I wasn't going to tolerate that. And also because I had the leash, he didn't need to protect me. But when the owner took the leash, he needed to protect him. Chris, okay. I tell you one thing: you're lucky to have Janice on this show. This is like, <laughs> this is all stuff is like biblical truth. Do you know the when you go to the veterinarian, we we call it putting the treat into treatment. Uh, hundreds of fear-free hospitals have basically bubble gum machines with treats in it, and they have it in between the double doors, and they have it inside. And we want people to stop by all the time and get a treat. And then for the dogs that are that are more timid, we have stuff that's even tastier. So they have uh, Chiru paste or Braunschweig or something that, as Temple Grandin says, is familiar to them. It's not uh, Collins Street Bakery um, cake leftover, fruit cake leftover from Christmas that they don't know. But when they come in and get Braunschweig, I guarantee you they know when you're getting close to that place, there might be some more Braunschweiger there. And Janice, you said one other thing, and Don, I ought to give you a chance to talk. I'm sorry, get a while excited here. Um, we've been telling people for thunderstorms for years to desensitize them, to to take them out into the country, to board them somewhere, to you know put them in their bases in a fortress. They don't do it. It's so frustrating. And I think you said that at the start, you know, they don't prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And it, I guarantee you, the audience knows if you catch on fire, stop, drop and roll. We all got the same damn talk when the firemen come to school and you catch on fire, stop, drop and roll. How many people know what to do if faced an aggressive dog? The tendency is to run. Then you're going to get your ass chewed off. Uh, if not something worse, you talked about being bit in the face, you know, the, the term is stand like a tree or lay like a log, but it's, there's needs to be a change, uh, in veterinary school. When I went to school in 1976, almost all of us were farm kids. We had seen births. We'd handled all kinds of animals. Very few of the people going to veterinary school have ever seen a live birth and they have not handled very many animals. So the number of injuries has dramatically gone up from what it used to be years ago. And one thing that's interesting, Banfield, the pet hospital, which has 1,400 hospitals, just completed a study of 100 hospitals that were fear-free and 100 hospitals that were not fear-free in the same markets. And there was a 50% reduction in injuries if the practices, practices did fear-free. And really all that is, it's not remodeling the practice. It's remodeling your animal handling techniques. And Don's probably a good vet. I'm a shitty vet. I'm, I'm good in the exam room. That's it. Uh, these senior pets with multimodal conditions better go to Don and not me. I'm a lousy surgeon. But when I went to Ukraine to help those pets, I wasn't going to help with a sick dog or an injured dog. 
but I help them learn how to interact with those pets coming across the border into Romania and Moldova. And they'd all want to come out and they'd stick their hand in their face and lean over and, oh my God, what's its name? And they get bit instead of standing, turning sideways, taking a knee, glancing at the pet without prolonged eye contact and calling it over. And once they started doing that, the, you know, they're not bad dogs. They're just extremely stressed and the people were stressed. Sure. Um, you know, you Dr. Marty, it's interesting. Yeah. it's interesting that you said that because that's one of the things that I teach, not just vet techs and, and veterinarians themselves, is how not to get bitten. Um, even the way somebody stands up from a chair, when you stand up, typically you lean forward. So if you have a dog who's not particularly stable and you lean forward and stand, you're already hovering over. And that's why a lot of dogs have issues with toddlers, with elderly people, with people who are a bit debilitated because they tend to lean forward. And also what you said about, by the way, T Temple Grandin's a very close friend of mine for about 15 years. Um, and I talk with her. Um, she jokes that every time I, we speak, uh, she's giving a, me a master's degree in something else that she knows. Um, <laughs> and we had long talks about it because I train service dogs. And she told me a funny story about one local um, organization who supposedly trains service dogs. And all they did was keep feeding treats under the table at the restaurant while she was sitting with the person. And the dog didn't go to sleep because it was sitting there waiting for its next treat. Where when I go with her, my dogs know when we go into a place, we sit under a table, you go there, you sleep. You don't need to do anything. And people do get too focused on food. Um, yesterday, we were, we were walking around and there was some guy, young guy, definitely had some issues. And his dog was very reactive. And he, he said, oh, we have to do the scatter technique. And I looked at him, I said, scatter technique? You mean you have to run? He says, no, we have to throw food all over. I said, we're next to a pond with ducks. I said, I really wouldn't want your dog licking things and eating things off the floor. He can wind up with Giardia or God knows what else. Um, why are you throwing food? Well, because I have to distract the dog. I said, why not just teach the dog that she shouldn't react? And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, how do you do that? And here he was going to, unfortunately, to a, a veterinary behaviorist, boarded be, a behaviorist, um, who was telling him just every time you see a dog, you know, or, or whatever you think your dog's going to react to, take food and throw it. So to me, that is, first of all, you're, you're distracting the dog. I don't want to distract the dog. I want to change the behavior. And I want to change the behavior by teaching the dog what we expect. I find that too often, people will be quick to make a correction with their dog, but they never pet their dog. We don't need to use food. I mean, some people use food. That's fine. I don't. Um, I just give my dogs treats because I love them. And I probably give my dogs treats all the, like more than most people because they're always good. So I just love them. But what I tend to see is that what people will do um, when I do these Sunday classes, last week we had this a couple days ago, we had 30 dogs and probably 27 of them were severely reactive and had bite histories on either humans or dogs. And I'd say, okay, give your dog a gentle correction and then reward them. And they would correct the dog and I'd watch and I'd watch and I'd watch and I'd say, where's the reinforcement of the, hey, that's what I want. Oh, I forgot. And I had to constantly, it happens every week, constantly re reminding people when your dog walks past that situation that he normally reacts to show him that that's what you wanted don't just punish him and correct him when he does it wrong reinforce the moments that he's doing it right so if he walks by another dog that he normally would have reacted to reach down and pet him so he says oh wow that's great i want to get that more let's see what did i do all right i just lay here and i get petted or i can try to go kill that other dog and i get corrected it's like a child. If you're always telling the child how, well, you've got a B plus and I expect you to get A's and you got a B plus, you're not getting any privileges. And then the child brings the grade up to let's say an A minus and the parents never acknowledge it. So the kid says, you know what? I'm not gonna work hard anymore because I get the same no matter what happens. You have to make a difference and catch those moments. I People ask me all the time, 
what's the most important thing with dog behavior? And I say, well, it's two things, a committed owner. And the, my worst nightmare is an uncommitted owner. And the second thing is timing. Everything is timing. If you come into the house and your puppy had an accident, urinated or defecated on your, let's say on your front porch and you're met, you're angry or in the living room and you punish him. He doesn't know that he did that because dogs think in 10 second increments, not that they won't remember things, but he's not thinking of that. He's thinking of, oh, hi, you're home and you punish him. Everything is timing. If you catch him doing that within that first 10 seconds or so, then you can correct him. Don't be abusive, but you can correct him. And it means something because he's like, oh, you didn't want me to do that versus just getting angry and coming in and storming in when that dog really was just waiting to see you there. And he doesn't understand why you're angry at him. So timing is everything. Make sure you hug and kiss and coddle and snuggle. And if you want to give him treats, do that, but do it after he's done that good thing to kind of highlight that. Yes, that's what I want. Hey, animal lovers, just give us a few minutes. We're going to go to station identification and let our sponsors speak. In the meantime, stay tuned. We'll be right back. I'm Burt Ward, Robin from TV's Batman, inviting you to feed your dog Gentle Giant's canned dog and puppy food, prepared with fresh meats, fresh fruits, and fresh vegetables that can make a huge difference in taste and nutrition for your dog. Our 27 and a half year old wolfhound Tara has lived more than triple her normal lifespan, eating only Gentle Giant's dry dog food mixed with Gentle Giant's canned dog food at Target, HEB, and stores near you. Try Gentle Giant's cat and kitten food too. Gentle Giant's for life. Folks, welcome back to All Paws Pet Talk Radio and TV. Dr. Marty, you said something very interesting there before when you were talking about the um, number of injuries, I guess, you know, to veterinarians and techs. You're probably a little younger than me. I don't know. I mean, we're more or less about the same generation, but you can probably remember when applying to veterinary school meant you either had family members who were veterinarians or you came from a farm. Uh, if you did not have a lifetime of animal experience, you know, your application just went in the, in, the, in the trash can. They wanted students who were raised on farms, raised working with animals. You know, and you mentioned that I, I, I went to school in Italy. You know, cats and dogs were barely mentioned in the curriculum. They, they taught us animals that made financial sense. And, and, you know, we learned horses, we learned cows and we learned pigs. And to some extent, you know, small ruminants and, and, and poultry. But cats and dogs were, you know, mentioned as an aside if they happen to have to talk about rabies or something. But um, they were they they were they were not important. Uh, most animals were, you know, animals that were economically important, and that's how U.S. veterinary schools used to be, probably until what the late '60s or so, or mid '60s, and then things started to change here. But yeah, you you had to have experience working with animals before they would even admit you into a veterinary school. And you're right, maybe that's something lacking from the curriculum uh, or curricula today. Uh, Dusty, there, there's, um, there, there's something I thought about when you were, you were talking about the aggression. As a clinician, one of the most common scenarios we see when animals come in with, with bite wounds, probably 50% of them are animals within the same household that attack each other. Uh, I've always been taught that it's some form of mis misdirected aggression or misguided or redirected aggression. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I use the analogy with my clients is you know, that's the reason police hate to go on domestic violence calls because uh, they'll go out there to break up two fighting spouses and inevitably the two spouses will gang up on the cop. And that's why those calls are so particularly dangerous. And the scenario you see, you know, the two dogs will be, both of them will be trying to get or barking at a squirrel or a possum or something across the window, snarling and biting and attacking the window, can't get at it. And they will suddenly look at each other and attack each other because of this, I guess, frustration at not being able to get what they want. Maybe you can touch on that from a behaviorist standpoint. Or Dr. Marty, you probably deal oh, with I, that. I, I, I didn't know who, who you wanted. Can uh, I say something kind of quickly on that? And then we can kick it back over to Dr. Marty. Um, one of the problems is that when people have dogs that either redirect aggression is there's usually one that starts them out. I saw Dr. Marty has a little Jack Russell or a, 
or a rat terrier on his lap. <laughs> they are tough little guys. Um, I can't play piano anymore because of what one did to me um, and my hands. But people also, when they have two or three dogs, it's like having kids. You have to train or work with each one individually. So what people do, and, and this uh, dog that was there, Milo, the one I mentioned earlier, that was reacting to my dogs, they have like a 14-year-old puggle at home. And they came to me because their, their large dog, 100-pound dog, was going after the puggle. So I had him separate the dog out, separate the behaviors out. Because what people do is they just have these two dogs and then they see something outside or whatever. Or uh, when you walk in the front door, as you enter, they're all jumping and then they all go at each other. So what you have to do, I call it the divide and conquer method. Work with each dog individually. So put one away in another room, let them chase or bark at the squirrel. You go to the window, you look out, make sure you see up, oh, there's nothing there. Don't say a word, walk away. When you get that dog to the point where it understands, okay, there's nothing there, put that dog away, take your next one. Work with it individually, work with them with the rules, work with them with behavior, take them out for walks separately because you'll see who the problem is. There's One of them is probably not gonna be reacting to dogs and other things, the other one probably is. And then you know where you can put your time. Um, and dogs are very positional also. So if you allow your dog to be up behind you on a chair or on a sofa, he thinks that he's, because he's above you, he is basically your parent. You are not in charge anymore. So be aware of where your dogs hang out. And if you see that you're, especially the little dogs always going up behind you or trying to posture, that can be a sign that that dog is, is in need of some additional help from either a behaviorist or um, from a really, really, really good trainer if you can find one. Dr. Marty, what say you? I'm sure enjoying this. My gosh, this is, <laughs> this is, can you hear me? This is, this has been unbelievable today. I, I pardon? Oh, okay. I, I do have to tell you a funny story real quick. This dog is a, he came from California on wings of rescue. So he's a California lowrider. So he's, he's Dachshund, Chihuahua and Jack Russell. And, uh, he, he's got arthritis of the spine. He's pretty old. And I was having a dinner one time at the Capitol Grill on the sidelines of VMX in Orlando, Dr. Don, uh, one of the world's, well, definitely the world's largest veterinary meeting in North America. And I was describing how he has trouble licking himself sometimes. He likes to lick himself down there. And I said, I feel so sorry for him that, you know, sometimes I help him. And they go, oh, God, no, you don't. And I go, oh, God, not that. I lift his leg up so he can get it. But I thought, now that would be. <laughs> I was going to make a comment there when you picked up that dog. I was going to ask you, is that dog dead or is he an example of what you do with your pralosam? Yeah. <laughs> in, in the words of the late Don Dooley, you might remember who. Oh he was. God, I love Don. And, and he had Jack Russells, and he used to say, "If a Jack Russell's not bouncing off the walls, something is wrong." Hey, folks, we'll be right back with All Paws Pet Talk TV and Radio. Join us in a few minutes. I'm Burt Ward, Robin from TV's Batman, and I believe there's nothing more precious than life. From the first bites as a puppy to the senior years, Gentle Giants is the only food your dog needs for life. Gentle Giants for life. Hey, folks, we're back on Alpha's Pet Talk Radio and TV. Veterinary medicine is an extremely difficult profession. My sister's a physician, a Yale-educated physician. And she has it so damned easy. She's a nephrologist. She knows one organ and typically on one group of people that are all older. And Don, you've been, I've never, I grew up on a farm and ranch, but was never in mixed practice, but uh, we've dealt with our own horses and cattle and chickens and stuff. I mean, it's multiple species, multiple age groups, surgeon, radiologist, pharmacist, internal medicine, behaviors counselor bereavement counselor it goes on and on long hours 
uh, life and death decisions every day. You see death almost every day. There's nobody. My sister doesn't see death. You know, she doesn't in her office that ends up in ER somewhere. I just got back from a vacation in New Zealand and Australia. And in both of those countries, uh, pet insurance is is way, way more prevalent than it is here. You know, they're just, and it's, it's almost to the same level as Europe, you know, in, in your, several countries. I guess it's mandatory to have it. And the TV ads in the evening, you don't get all the pharmaceutical ads that we get here in this country on, on, on TV at night, thank goodness. But you're inundated in animal insurance ads. Uh, there's all these different competing companies advertising for pet insurance. And they're saying, you know, they're holding up a veterinarian's bill and said, you would, what would you do if you had a bill, you know, like this for your, for your pet? And, you know, I, I think in one respect, it can be a big help to our profession. The other hand, though, is we all have seen what it's done. And, and Marty, your sister can probably tell you all the horror stories about the human uh, insurance situation. Once it's a slippery slope, once we let these people get a foot in the door, I think it would spell the end of veterinary medicine as you and I have known it for our careers. Uh, once you let, I call it, let the parasites in, the HMOs, the insurance companies, the, the all the for-profit people, once you get all these parasites into the system and everybody wants their little piece of the pie, uh, you never get it back because you know, there's... there's it, it's too lucrative for them. You can never get rid of them. And I, I would hate to see our profession end up the way the human medical profession has beholden to insurance companies where they're dictating treatments, they're dictating costs, they're dictating protocols to us. And in the end, we become employees of insurance companies, no longer independent veterinarians doing what we've been trained to do and doing what's best for our patients and our clients. And I'll shut up. Well, I think it just makes a two-tier system like in Canada, right? Those that are not far from you, Marty, those that can afford it come south of the border to get the medical care they need because they don't want to wait, right? So, I mean, uh, medical tourism is a thing, and it'll be veterinary medical tourism when somebody figures out how to do this better. Uh, you know, uh, again, to your point, Janice, nurse practitioners are always there now instead of the doc because all of those things are are challenged in terms of labor shortages so hey guys this has been a very insightful great conversation and i do want us to have more conversation about this on the show because it is so important and from a guy who makes his living in the pet industry uh you know we want to promote first of all responsible pet ownership that's number one and when we talk about some of these things like you said janice where uh, you wish that people would teach their animals teach their kids just teaching, well, that's gone out the window because everybody's on social media and they're too self-absorbed with all of that, watching funny animal videos, right? So we have a larger issue at play, but if it continues down this path, we won't have vets, then we won't have, people will be discouraged from getting pets and it becomes a fulfilling cycle, a self-fulfilling cycle that becomes destructive. So Don, I hope you're right. I hope we can break this down into a shorter period of time that's more concentrated that let some of these really smart kids who really want to be involved for the right reason get involved for the right reason, break it down into helpful areas where it doesn't necessarily have to be a DVM degree. It could be something, let's say, lesser but more specialized um, to really help the profession because that's just going to help the whole animal world, the whole kingdom, right? We'll be right back with All Paws Pet Talk TV and radio. I'm Burt Ward, Robin from TV's Batman, and I believe there's nothing more precious than life. From the first bites as a puppy to the senior years, Gentle Giants is the only food your dog needs for life. Gentle Giants for life. So once again, guys, I can't thank you enough. Uh, what a great discussion. Marty, I hope to see you at Super Zoo. Thank you, guys. And folks, tune back in very, very soon for the next episode of All Paws Pet Talk TV and radio. We'll see you soon. 